Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you very much to the uh, organizers. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, celebrate Poincaré. Uh, of course, there are some areas of mathematics where uh, the, the contribution of Poincaré has been uh, very well known and advertised and so forth. And uh, I think on the other side, uh, that there are areas of mathematics like partial differential equations where uh, Poincaré has not been celebrated enough, and uh, one of them is really partial differential equation, and that's what I would like to convince you today. Uh, so here is the, uh, the plan of my talk. Uh, I will explain uh, how Poincaré became my hero. And uh, I mean hero from the point of view of partial differential equation. And uh, it was fairly, fairly recently uh, that this happened. And uh, then I will say, uh, explain why, according to Poincaré, one should uh, study uh, partial differential equations. Uh, really, there is a text uh, where uh, Poincaré has a prophetic insight into partial differential equations and uh, really very modern answers to the question why one should study a partial differential equation. Uh, and then I'm going to go into a specific about the contribution of Poincaré in partial differential equations. Uh, first of all, uh, the Dirichlet principle and there I am going to talk, and I don't think I exaggerate, about a conspiracy of silence concerning uh, Poincaré cont contribution to the uh, Dirichlet principle. Uh, then I'll talk about the spectrum of the Laplacian. Uh, Poincaré's inequality, I'll say, uh, go very briefly because we had just the previous talk by uh, Michel Ledoux on this subject. And uh, then I'll talk about a nonlinear PDE solved by uh, Poincaré. Uh, when I, I was a student in this, uh, in this building at the Institut Poincaré, in the Institut Poincaré, in the, the 60s, I uh, was taking uh, graduate courses. Uh, in this very room, uh, Laurent Schwartz was teaching. I was taking his class, Pista Algebra, uh, the, no contribution of Poincaré, as far as I know, uh, there, Poincaré was never mentioned. The god in this course was uh, Gelfand, of course. Uh, then I, in the other room, in the other amphitheater, uh, Darbou, I was taking the course of uh, Gustave Choquet. Uh, this was about uh, extreme points, convex set, extreme point, integral representation, and so forth. I don't think Poincaré was ever mentioned there. <laughs> And uh, I was taking uh, a class of Jacques-Louis Lyons in numerical analysis. There was nothing in partial differential equation. And uh, he was in exile. This was not good enough. Partial differential equation was not good enough at that time. Uh, Bourbaki was the king here. Not good enough to be taught in the Institut Poincaré. And he was in exile. Jacques-Louis Lyons was in exile in the Institut Blaise Pascal, devoted to a numerical analysis. And that's probably where I heard for the first time uh, Poincaré's inequality. But that's it, period. Then I went to Pisa, then the Courant Institute. Always Poincaré's inequality, the inequality of Poincaré, and so forth. That's it, period. No mention ever, never, ever anything else about Poincaré. And uh, the situation changed, at least for me, about uh, 15 years ago. I was asked to write uh, a survey of PDEs in the 20th century. And uh, I consulted uh, Felix Browder, who is an, uh, an expert on uh, history of mathematics, and uh, he accepted to join me on this uh, project, and uh, indeed, so here it is, our paper. And uh, I was sure that we would start the 20th century in partial differential equation with Hilbert, and uh, the famous, the big Hilbert and his famous solution 
of the uh, Dirichlet principle. That's what I thought it would start. And uh, as I'm going to, going to explain, well, the uh, story is more complicated than that. And uh, in fact, what we discovered is that before, just before Tilburg, there was major, major contribution of Poincaré in the 10 years uh, preceding uh, Hilbert and his uh, famous program. Now, uh, you all know uh, the story uh, about the Dirichlet principle that in the period uh, between uh, 1830 and 1850, uh, people realized that there was correspondence between the solution of the Laplace equation, the Dirichlet principle, the Laplace equation with uh, given boundary condition, and the minimization of the so-called Dirichlet integral. So uh, those were people were involved were Green, Gauss, Lord Kelvin, Riemann, and Riemann wrongly assumed, you know the story, that uh, the minimum exists, made a big mistake. He thought everything, uh, every functional uh, has, a minimize, has a minimizer, it's bounded below. And uh, it was uh, Weierstrass who caught uh, this mistake in uh, 1869. And so the existence of a solution for the Laplace equation uh, became an open problem. And the standard folklore says that the problem was open until the big Hilbert solved this and gave a rigorous proof that the minimum was achieved and so gave a rigorous proof by consequence that the uh, Dirichlet problem had a solution. So when we had to start this paper, we, when we started this paper, we went to look at the Hilbert paper of 1900. Also, it's a round date, good date. So uh, 1900, Hilbert, the solution of the uh, Dirichlet problem. And I must confess that I was under shock when we looked, when we saw the, uh, this, this Hilbert paper. Uh, first of all, what I had in mind was that Hilbert how do you prove today that the minimum is achieved of the Dirichlet integral? You take a minimizing sequence and you prove that it's a Cauchy sequence by the standard argument, you know, the same argument that one uses today to prove the existence of a projection on a convex set in the, in the Hilbert space. I thought that this was the proof that uh, Hilbert had discovered. Of course, he could not have discovered this proof because this would imply Cauchy sequences would mean that he knew that the space L2 was complete, which was not known in 1900. It's only Fisher who proved this in 1906. And I don't know, in my dreams, I thought, well, maybe he invented weak topology and that he passed to the limit on the minimizing sequence using weak topology. No, absolutely not. And uh, so, let me show you what we, what we discovered. This is the, uh, the Hilbert paper. In fact, it's in two parts. There is an announcement in 1900 and uh, a more detailed paper in 1904. So this is the, uh, the, more, detailed, the more detailed version. And uh, I'm just going to flash it. It's... Uh, to flash it, few, just a few pages. Uh, it's, uh, I, I must confess, it's, it's really a, a paper which I find very confusing. Look, just look at the, uh, the, the typography. It's just, it just, you don't, that's not the kind of, of mathematics, of nice mathematics that you want to read. So here is one page. Look at this. Completely sloppy. <laughs> Look, you can, I mean, this is Hilbert's, Hilbert's solution of very, uh, very confusing, really uh, totally obscure. 
In fact, what he does, I mean, in a few words, takes a minimizing sequence for the Dirichlet integral, then he regularizes it, and then he passes to a limit along a subsequence using ASCOLI, because that was the kind of tool or kind of as a version of ASCOLI, kind of tools that one, uh, that one, uh, that one knew at the time. And, uh, but I must say this, I considered Hilbert's contribution more as a program and uh, that he, he said, let's try to go back to the idea of Riemann and prove rigorously that it has a minimizer. And the program was indeed a very successful program as the, because it was the beginning of the uh, uh, calculus, the modern calculus of uh, variation. So this is, this is Hilbert. And uh, so we are very disappointed, and uh, we continued searching. And here is something that we found a little later, Adama on the Dirichlet principle. And uh, this is a very interesting paper from uh, 1906 in the Bulletin de la Société Mathématique de France. Very short, uh, three pages, four pages. And... Uh, Obviously, as you are going to see, he is not happy. He's really unhappy with uh, Hilbert. Uh, but he is the only person in the world who has the guts to say it uh, clearly that uh, the king is naked. You had to be Hadamard to, to be willing to, uh, to say this. And uh, here are a few sentences that I uh, want to extract from uh, Adamard's uh, paper. Monsieur Hilbert, Mr. Hilbert has, has uh, solved, has found a method, or uh, did not really have indicated a method, along giving the possibility to solve the Dirichlet problem by the method which has uh, been used by Riemann, that is minimizing directly the, the Dirichlet integral. And he gives the, uh, so this is the, uh, the assumption, he says, the assumptions of Hilbert, in fact, is that the boundary of, uh, should be analytic and the uh, boundary condition, the boundary of the domain should be analytic and the boundary conditions uh, should also be analytic. Okay, so that's the restriction, he says, Hilbert needs to. Uh, and then he says, well, look at this sentence. On fait, one knows that the existence has been established by other methods, assuming only the continuity of the boundary data. Very mysterious. Uh, who has established it? No mention. And, uh, I think this might have been and, uh, kind of the beginning of what I call conspiracy of silence. Uh, and so we didn't know who were, who were the other keys who had established just under continuity of the, the boundary condition. And then he goes on and he says, this is a very serious restriction indeed. And uh, Hilbert, for example, by his method, could not solve it for a general continuous function. Hilbert's method would never work. And then he uh, gives an example, you see it's inapplicable. Uh, and uh, then he goes on and gives an example, in fact, it was not the first time that such an example, there were similar examples given before by Prim uh, 20 years, uh, almost 30 years ago, before that, of an example of a boundary condition which is continuous, but not in modern language, not H1 half. So it's not a trace of a function of finite energy on the domain. And he says, with such a boundary condition which is continuous, you cannot solve the problem by the uh, method of Hilbert. And here are the concluding word. Nous voyons que la méthode de Hilbert peut être inapplicable alors même que le problème de Dirichlet a effectivement une solution, period. Really unhappy, he says the solution exists, but Hilbert's method would not give anything. He has not the guts to say exactly the method is mm -mm -mm, so so, uh, I don't understand, but he says anyway, this is not, this is not a method that uh, is uh, completely uh, always uh, useful. So 
I was, uh, well, we were fascinated by this sentence in the paper of Adam Moore saying one knows that the existence has been established by others, by other people, of the existence of a solution of the uh, Dirichlet problem. And wanted to know who. And uh, we went backwards now. And uh, what we discovered, that's how we discovered the fundamental contributions of uh, Poincaré on uh, PDEs. Uh, so here is a list of uh, four papers which are absolutely remarkable by Poincaré. And uh, I'm going to uh, discuss them. Uh, look also, look where the papers are published. The pa first one is published in the American Journal of Math. Uh, second one is in the Rendeconti di Palermo. Third one, Acta Mathematica. And the fourth one in Journal de... So there are four countries. That says already a lot about the international uh, vision of uh, Poincaré. Uh, the US, Italy, Sweden, France. Okay? That's quite remarkable. If you look at, for example, at where the German mathematicians uh, were uh, publishing, uh, mostly in uh, German, German journals. So there's something special already about Poincaré and uh, his uh, international collaboration. Look also where the first paper is published in the American Journal in 1890. The US was not a very a super, super mathematical superpower that it is today. I don't know. It would be like if you send, you have a good paper and you send it, uh, no offense, but say you send it to a Korean journal or something. That was what the American Journal of Math was in 18, 1890. Uh, okay, then there is our other contributions. Uh, by Poincaré, for example, on the telegraph equation. And uh, here I refer to, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, I refer to a very interesting uh, paper of uh, Jean Marouin, who is here on the uh, Poincaré and, uh, and the telegraph equation. I'm going also to, to uh, give you a few uh, references of papers about, not by Poincaré, but about Poincaré. Uh, and uh, just to show you that there has been very, for a long, long time, there has been very little analysis of Poincaré's contribution to uh, PDEs. Uh, there is, a, in the Acta Mathematica in 1921, uh, the volume is uh, dedicated to Poincaré, and uh, there, there are there is a long article of an, an analysis by Poincaré about uh, his own work. And uh, there are a few pages about where he explains what he did about uh, PDEs. Then uh, uh, in the same volume, uh, there is a, a long article by Adamar, where you find also just a few pages about uh, Poincaré and PDEs. And uh, Laurent Schwartz has also in, uh, in the, the published in the collected work of Poincaré uh, in 1955, has also a few pages about uh, Poincaré and PDE. And then there is a big, big gap. And uh, I think it's only uh, in the past uh, 15 years or so that people have put the focus on Poincaré and PDEs. And I really uh, recommend to you, if you want to learn more details, I'll make a sketch in my talk. If you want to read more details, there are beautiful, really beautiful papers of uh, Jean Marouin on uh, Henri Poincaré and partial differential equations. I've learned myself a lot about that. I also recommend the, uh, the book on the uh, Uniformisation des surfaces de Riemann, uh, published by the uh, Ecole Normale uh, de Lyon, under its a collective work. And uh, again, here another paper, by a recent paper by uh, Jean Marouin. And also I refer to the uh, paper by Grégoire Allaire on the uh, Sobolev inequality in uh, Matapi. But you see, that's all 
very recent kind of recent discovery of uh, what Poincaré uh, did in uh, TB. Okay, we start with the first paper, the one in what I call the Korean Journal. Uh, and I want to go quickly over the first few pages because they are fascinating. And uh, the first thing he does, he gives a list of some partial differential equations coming from physics. So first you have the Laplace equation, and he calls this a Dirichlet problem, like everyone calls, and with, together with a boundary condition. And then uh, he goes on and talks about the... Uh, the heat equation, and then the wave equation. That's interesting because it's already a fairly modern presentation of PDEs, elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic. This is a classification which was then uh, made uh, more general by uh, Adamar in the, in the 20s. Uh, but it's already present here, this classification, and it's been followed if you look, for example, in the three volumes of Lyons Magenes, same thing. And I think Poincaré was the first to give this order, elliptic, Laplace equation, heat equation, and uh, wave equation that has been followed since uh, by lots of people. Okay, so here I come to what I call, those are a few lines, uh, in the introduction of this American Journal paper, uh, it's, since it's in, uh, in French, I've, uh, I'll read it in French, but uh, you have there the uh, English translation of some of the, uh, the passages. So first of all, it says, cette revue rapide des diverses parties de la, de la physique mathématique nous a convaincu que tous ces problèmes, malgré l'extrême variété des conditions limites, et même des équations différentielles ont pour ainsi dire un certain air de famille. Okay, so, family resemblance between the heat, la place, etc. Il, il est impossible de méconnaître, mais on doit s'attendre à leur trouver un très grand nombre de propriétés communes. Okay, so, number of common properties to all partial differential equations. And look at this sentence. Malheureusement, la première des propriétés communes à tous ces problèmes, c'est leur extrême difficulté. Interesting. Non seulement on ne peut le plus souvent les résoudre complètement. Complètement, he means explicitly. There are no explicit solutions for the Earth. Mais ce n'est qu'au prix des plus grands efforts qu'on peut en démontrer rigoureusement la possibilité. You see that he worked, he, 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 he himself acknowledges that he worked hard to prove the existence of a solution for the Laplace equation and others. And then he says uh, something that I like very much. Cette démonstration est-elle nécessaire? Why work so hard? And he says, la plupart des physiciens en feraient bon marché. Because you know that, anyway, you know that the solution of, uh, corresponds to some physical phenomenon, and a physicist will tell you the phenomenon is there. Let so why prove the, let why let bother proving the existence of a solution? Okay. And then he says, in any case, even if we bother, should we do it with the same rigor as we do other parts of analysis? And then he says, les équations différentielles auxquelles obéissent les phénomènes physiques n'ont été souvent établis que par des raisonnements peu rigoureux. On ne les regarde que comme des approximations. Anyway, those equations uh, have been derived with lots by physicists uh, doing lots of approximation. So why do we need to work so hard and uh, prove this uh, rigorously? So why make such, so much effort? And I must say, this is a question that we hear all the time. This date, not so much from the physicists, but people who are doing scientific computing, they will tell you, we can compute a solution. So it's there. Why bother to, to give a proof? And uh, then he gives the answer. 
néanmoins, toutes les fois que je le pourrai, je viserai à la rigueur absolue, absolute rigueur, pour deux raisons, deux raisons. First of all, il est toujours dur pour un géomètre, means a mathematician, d'aborder un problème sans le résoudre complètement. That's beautiful, isn't it? This is, you feel the joy of the mathematician. You cannot leave a problem until you solve it. It's like a drug. When you touch, when you start on the problem, you don't leave it until you completely solve it. And then he says something, and that's what I call the prophetic insight of Poincaré. Les équations que j'étudierai sont susceptibles non seulement d'applications physiques, mais encore d'applications analytiques. Analytique means within mathematics. C'est sur la possibilité du problème de Dirichlet que Riemann a fondé sa magnifique théorie des fonctions abéliennes. Says, look, Riemann has used, even, even, even if there was a flaw, I mean, the, the proof was defective, he has used the solution of the Laplace equation. So we, in his theory of abelian functions. So we need a proof because this is a pure, this is really a problem in mathematics. Okay, that's, we really need a proof for that. And then he says, depuis d'autres géomètres ont fait d'importantes applications de ce même principe aux parties les plus fondamentales de l'analyse pure. Est-il encore permis de se contenter d'une demi-rigueur et qui nous dit que les autres problèmes de la physique mathématique ne seront pas un jour, comme l'a déjà été le plus simple d'entre eux, appelé à jouer en analyse un rôle considérable. This is absolutely prophetic. If you think, uh, for example, of Fortevec de Pries and the, the solitons, the role that it had, it started in fluid mechanics, but then the uh, impact on algebraic geometry And then if you think of young Mills, uh, the instantons coming from physics and its impact on low dimensional topology. And of course, the most beautiful example is the Ricci flow. Uh, it's, a, it's a flow, it's, it's something like, which started like a, a variant of the, the heat equation, I would say, and or cousin, a distant cousin of the heat equation and the beautiful solution using the, the Ricci flow of the Poincaré conjecture. So maybe he, thought, maybe he had already a kind of prophetic insight that eventually the uh, Poincaré conjecture uh, would be solved via partial differential equation. Okay, now let's go to the papers. So here is the first theorem that already alluded to. In 1890, in the same... Uh, American Journal paper, uh, Poincaré gave a proof of the theorem. Uh, you take a domain of R3, smooth bounded domain in R3, but for that matter, any domain in Rn, smooth domain in Rn, would uh, also, same kind of proof which should be applied. And uh, given any continuous boundary condition, you have a unique solution of the Laplace equation, Laplace in U equals zero, satisfying the boundary condition U equals phi on the, the boundary. And uh, of course, there were some uh, predecessors, uh, and uh, Poincaré uh, is very careful to, to mention them. Uh, Hermann Schwartz in 1969 uh, had the solution in R2, and uh, especially Neumann in 78 gave a solution, but just for uh, convex domains. And it is in this paper that uh, Poincaré invents the, uh, the so-called balayage method. Not going to explain what it is. I just want to say that it relies on uh, three ingredients which were known at the time of Poincaré. The maximum principle, the Poisson formula, which is a solution of the Dirichlet problem on the ball, in fact, an explicit solution, integral. You, you can write the solution of uh, the Laplace equation in the ball with a given boundary condition. You can write it as an integral. That, that was known at the time of Poincaré. And then the uh, Harnack principle, which was also known. That is, if you have a sequence, it's related to the so-called Harnack inequality also. If you have a 
and it free a monotone increase in sequence of harmonic functions, and you know that at one point uh, the sequence is uh, bounded, then uh, it will be bounded everywhere, and you have a limit converges to a harmonic function. And uh, if you look at the uh, either at the American uh, Journal of Math uh, article, or uh, you can look at his book. Uh, published a few years later in 1909, uh, Théorie du potentiel Newtonien, which was from a course at the, the Sorbonne uh, in between 94 and 95. And uh, really, look at just a few pages. I am going to flash a few pages. And I'm doing this on purpose, just to show you the contrast with Hilbert's paper. Uh, just this is, <laughs> this is beautiful. First of all, he starts resolution of the problem of Dirichlet. Uh, so he, he states, he states, l'énoncé du problème de Dirichlet, you have a domain, and uh, he, suppose, he assumes that it's connected. Okay, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily simply connected. You have a continuous data on the boundary, and uh, you want to construct a function which is harmonic inside, and assumes the boundary conditions. Very clearly stated, and he states the problem de Dirichlet ne peut pas admettre plus d'une solution. We already saw this. This was maximum principle, uniqueness of the solution. And uh, he says what we are going to prove is that it admits a solution. And look at, look at the presentation. Look, just, I mean, I wish I had attended this course in PDE by, uh, by Poincaré, uh, and uh, just beautiful, very clear presentation, notation, everything is well explained. Uh, there are pictures, enormously uh, crystal, crystal clear. Look at, uh, just look, look at that. Okay, and in fact, in fact, I want to mention here a comment I don't know, it's a little small. It's a footnote in a paper by Adamar, which I discovered. And I like very much this footnote. Chez uh, Poincaré, l'idée première, so this is Adamar who says, who, who writes this, l'idée première d'une recherche est toujours mise en évidence avec une merveilleuse netteté. Qu'on est loin de trouver toujours au même degré chez les plus grands maîtres. I don't know if he has in mind Hilbert or not, but probably. C'est dire, look at this sentence, c'est dire que l'accusation d'obscurité lancée parfois contre lui nous paraît du moins, au point de vue de lecteur, qui va au fond des choses, exprimer le contraire de la vérité. I say that's what one has in mind. Many people have in mind Hilbert clear, everything is transparent, went very uh, point carré, makes mistakes, and so forth. No, no, not, not true. This is completely wrong and should be, uh, this, this is distortion of truth, and I think everyone agrees, uh, I, mean, I hope everyone agrees with. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's about the paper in the American Journal, and then a few years later, and that's interesting, uh, he comes back and give another proof, so this is in the uh, Acta Mathematica paper, uh, six years later, and he says, I'm giving you another method, even though, nous savons que la méthode du balayage permet de démontrer le principe de Dirichlet dans le cas général, we already have proved this, uh, but, uh, cette, même si, si cette méthode est très bonne comme procédé de démonstration, no problem with the proof, elle est inférieure comme procédé de calcul à celle de Neumann. He had already in mind, probably, and uh, I don't know, there are other sentences here and there where it's clear that uh, Poincaré was concerned with doing a numerical computation. So, so he says, and so here is another proof. Neumann had proved it, as he says, for convex surfaces. So I'm extending, I'm using the same method as Neumann, but now for uh, general, general domains. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the aftermath 
of uh, Poincaré's uh, theorem is a bit sad, I think, and uh, I wonder if we should get the right name, the conspiracy of silence or not, but uh, Poincaré's name is never mentioned in modern textbooks on partial differential equation as the father of the solution of the Dirichlet problem. Never, ever. He remains alive in potential theory because of the Balayage method, but PDE, uh, take for example the textbook of uh, Craig Evans on partial differential equation, not mentioned. Uh, and I challenge you, if you see a textbook in partial differential equation where Poincaré is mentioned, except for the Poincaré's inequality, and we are going to come back to this, please send me an email and I'll correct my, uh, my statement. Now, why is that so? Uh, I have some two suppositions. First of all, Poincaré's method is indeed a bit restrictive, but for example, he uses the maximum principle, and uh, so it restricts to second order elliptic equation. And so, for example, the by Laplacian, this is excluded. That's where you really need the beauty of the uh, energy method a la Hilbert to prove the existence of uh, a solution. So, wider class, indeed, but still. And then he uses this explicit Poisson formula on the ball, so that's also might be restricted to the Laplacian, and uh, one would have uh, more difficulties adapting this, say, for example, to variable coefficient operator. Okay, I don't know, I don't know. Those are just suppositions. Uh, uh, I, I have a suspicion that the bad guy here is uh, Courant, Richard Courant, who was a student of Hilbert, and uh, I think it's not and, you know, the Courant Institute in the 50s became the temple of partial differential equations. So that's where everyone, and I went there in the late 60s to study partial differential equations. That's where all of the activity in partial differential equation was uh, more or less uh, concentrated. And uh, here is the book that Rich Richard Courant wrote on the Dirichlet principle. There were earlier versions, maybe in German or so, on the Dirichlet principle, in uh, this one was in English, published in 1950. And uh, again, let me flash a few, the few pages. The first, so this is in page two of the introduction. So he tells the story about the uh, the about the, the the Dirichlet problem. Again, the same story that I already mentioned. Uh, Gauss, Thompson, Lord, this is Lord Kelvin uh, wanted to solve the Laplace equation in the plane with a given boundary condition. And uh, then Riemann uh, used it under the name Dirichlet principle, and then Weierstrass found the flaw, came as a shock to the mathematical world. And uh, the, uh, there were efforts in later years, after 69, to save Dirichlet principle, and the efforts remained unsuccessful. Time and again, attempts at a rigorous proof were made. Finally, look at this sentence, 50 years after Riemann, Hilbert succeeded. Ta-da-da-ta, that's uh, in the famous publication, he established the existence theorem proving directly and so forth. No mention of Poincaré, and this is the book on the Dirichlet principle, not in the text, not in the footnotes, not in the references. This is almost unbelievable, unheard of. Um, so it's time to, I think it's really time to, to break this uh, conspiracy of science. Oh, by the way, by the way, in this book, if you really want to understand uh, what was the, the content of the original idea of Hilbert, you can find it, and how you can make a rigorous proof out of Hilbert's idea, you can find this in the book. Now, this book was written in 1950. At that time, people knew very well had the Cauchy sequences and so forth. So there were trivial methods for proving directly 
the existence of a minimizer. That's not what he does in his book. What he does, he takes Hilbert's ideas, those, uh, the, the one that uh, were very confusing, and uh, he takes those ideas and he explains how they can really work. That's how a good student should behave with his teacher. That's <laughs> to defend his teacher and the, the, the reputation of his teacher. Anyway, uh, I have done my mea culpa on uh, Poincaré. This is uh, taken the page uh, from my book, Analyse Fonctionnelle, in uh, 1983, uh, where I talk about the Dirichlet principle, and I credit Dirichlet, Riemann, Hilbert. This was in 1983. And uh, look at this. This is my page from my book on functional analysis. Uh, from two years ago, same Dirichlet principle, but now Dirichlet, Riemann, Poincaré, Hilbert. So uh, I've done my share. Okay, second big result of Poincaré on partial differential equation is about the spectrum of the Laplacian. Uh, so this is from uh, 1894. What he proves is you take a domain in R3 that could be Rn. There exists a sequence lambda k going to infinity of eigenvalues and corresponding eigenfunction of the Laplacian under Dirichlet boundary condition. In fact, he even handled more general boundary condition like uh, what's called today the, the Robin or third type of uh, boundary condition. Here again, there were a predecessor Schwarz, Hermann Schwarz, in 85, had proved the existence of the first eigenvalue, and Picard, just a year before Poincaré, had proved the existence of a second, second eigenvalue. That's it. But Poincaré did the big, big work of proving the existence of an infinite sequence of eigenvalues. This is absolutely a uh, spectacular achievement. I must say, just to be absolutely honest, that there is one deficiency in the, uh, I mean, it's not a deficiency, but uh, what he did not prove, what he did not establish there, is that what one calls, one would say today, that the uh, eigenfunction form a complete system. That is a Hilbert basis. Of course, this kind of concept was discovered later so that he was not really worried. Uh, but I must say, maybe, I don't know if he tried to prove something like this. Anyway, it's not there, and it's, uh, it's a bit missing, missing in this, uh, this paper. Uh, and I'm saying this because one of the reasons, I think, that Poincaré was interested in getting all the eigenvalues of the Laplacian was that he wanted to solve uh, the heat equation and the wave equation by the Fourier method, you know, by Fourier expansion. And for this, you, if you wanted to have a complete proof that it works via the Fourier expansion, of course, you, you would need to know that the eigenfunctions uh, form uh, Hilbert basis. But still, it's an absolutely spectacular achievement, and I think his name should be mentioned, remembered, celebrated, uh, because he paved the way to, uh, in the subsequent years, to the work of Fredholm. Absolutely, Fredholm uh, uh, continued this, uh, this work and uh, Hilbert. And uh, of course, uh, uh, needless to say, how much of spectral theory played uh, an important role in the 20th century. And that's a major example of uh, spectral theory. OK, uh, I'll be very brief on uh, Poincare's inequality because uh, uh, the, in the previous lecture, Michel Ledoux did, did a very, uh, uh, an excellent job. And uh, so here you have the Poincaré inequality for the convex domains with the constant, which is like uh, a constant depending only on the dimension divided by the uh, diameter squared. And I must say that, in fact, he was not after the Poincaré inequality. That was not his goal, but he used it as a tool in order to get the previous result, the existence of an infinite sequence of uh, eigenvalues. Uh, that's where 
were how he discovered this, uh, this inequality, almost, I would say, almost by accident. I don't think he was after that. And uh, here it's needless to add the, uh, the uh, tremendous uh, importance of, uh, of this inequality. It has a huge descendants. The Sobolev inequality, uh, where instead of L2, you have this uh, LP norm. And, uh, and uh, of course, the gagliardo nirenberg inequality, the whole business of best constant in the Sobolev inequality. Uh, Michel Ledoux mentioned all those uh, geometric applications of the Poincaré inequality. But of course, with the Sobolev inequality, uh, you have a major direction of applications also, which were not mentioned about the Yamabe problem, solution of the Yamabe problem, and uh, by uh, Thierry Obandan and other people, the use of the best constant in uh, Poincaré inequality it plays a major, major role in the, uh, in the Yamabe, in the, in the final solution of the Yamabe problem. Uh, what is a bit ironic, the, there is some ironical part that is the, the Poincaré inequality, the way it's, uh, it's uh, of, so this is so-called poincaré birkingers inequality. And uh, what people call today uh, the Poincaré inequality is uh, very often another form. Uh, it's for functions which vanish on the boundary in modern terminology, it's H1, uh, zero, this is the inequality. But uh, apparently he never considered this, this is not uh, not Poincaré. I, I don't know exactly who, to whom one should, uh, one should uh, attribute this, but this is really ironical. <laughs> Poincaré's inequality that everyone mentions and everyone teaches and you, that you hear over and over again is not due to Poincaré. On the other hand, major, major results uh, which he proved, really proved and uh, are, uh, are hardly ever mentioned, are not attached to, to his name. Okay, and uh, finally, say a few words about another <coughs> contribution of Poincaré in PDE. Uh, this is this time to a nonlinear PDE. And uh, what Poincaré uh, did, he considered this problem uh, minus Laplacian u plus theta of x e to the u equals k, equals a, uh, on a surface, on s, and uh, s is a Riemann surface, so two-dimensional, two with a Riemannian metric g. Laplacian is a Laplace Beltrami operator on, on s. Theta of x, which appears here, is a given smooth function, which is positive on S, and uh, K is a constant. Now, uh, this kind of problem was of interest uh, to Poincaré because uh, it arises as uh, an, a basic ingredient in the uh, uniformization theorem, and uh, here I should mention the excellent reference of the book uh, Uniformisation des surfaces de Riemann, in the uh, published at the, uh, by this uh, team of uh, this collective work published at the Ecole Normale and soon going to be published in English. And of course, it's also related to the search of a conformal metric on S with constant negative Gauss uh, curvature. So here is a result of uh, Poincaré from uh, 98, and also where uh, completing or complementing work of uh, Picard on this, uh, on this problem. This problem star has a unique, I mean double star has a unique solution given any function theta, positive function theta, and any positive constant k. Uh, proof is a bit complicated. In fact, it's well explained in the uh, reference in this book, uh, Uniformization. It's a bit complicated. Uh, it has one original ingredient, uh, which is the continuation method, uh, which unfortunately is always attributed to Bernstein, 
uh, in uh, 1906, but Poincaré did this, found it uh, eight years earlier. And the idea is to embed the problem, the problem double star that you want to solve in a one parameter family of uh, partial differential equations, P lambda, and P zero, the first one, you start with some easy problem, which you solve, which you solve with little effort. And at the end of the interval for lambda equals one, you have the problem, the tough problem that you want, uh, that you want to solve. And you solve it step by step, uh, going from zero, from zero to one. Okay. Um, here, uh, I should say, I must say that I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this, uh, this theorem. Uh, on the one hand, as you all know, I'm working in a nonlinear partial differential equation. So I'm happy I have prestigious ancestry, Poincaré was, was studying nonlinear partial differential equations. So I can claim great, great, great grandfather who was already working on uh, nonlinear partial differential equations. Uh, on the other hand, I uh, must say that today there are much simpler methods which are more powerful, much more powerful, simpler to solve this equation double star. Well, you are going to tell me that's not fair. It's 100 years after Poincaré, you tell me that there are new methods. Well, that's not, that's not a big deal. Uh, well, uh, let me make a point. There are at least three methods which you can use today to solve this. Uh, the first method is uh, the so-called method of sub and super solution. I'm going to say something in, about this in a minute. Uh, it goes back to Perron in the 30s. Uh, then convex minimization. That's also possible. You can use convex minimization. But that kind of thing came later. That was, in some sense, uh, Hilbert's program. And uh, so Poincaré could not have thought of this uh, in, uh, when, he, when he did this uh, nonlinear PDE. And uh, of course, certainly not the, uh, the monotone operators of Minty, Browder, et cetera, which started only in the 60s, which you can use and get very easily the existence of the solution. But I want to emphasize the, the method of sub and super solution uh, because it's very simple very robust and uses only tools that Poincaré knew. That is just basically the maximum principle. And he has used it over and over again. And uh, Poincaré, uh, uh, maximum principle plus a very simple monotone iteration gives the solution of this uh, nonlinear PDE. Not want to be critical, of course, of uh, Poincaré, but still, uh, just to say that he might, he might have discovered it, fair, probably fairly easily. So here is the. Uh, it's uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, with the statement. So here is statement is extremely general. You want to solve a nonlinear PDE minus Laplace in U equals f of x in U. Say which is smooth in x in U, just to make life simple and you have a pair of two functions, a sub and a super solution, which are ordered, the sub solution is less than the super solution. <coughs> sub solution means that you have this inequality, super solution means you have the reverse inequality, then that's it. This is sufficient to prove the existence of a solution in between the sub and the super, sub and super solution. And uh, just by you start with the sub-solution, for example, you solve by iteration, monotone iteration, and you prove it extremely simple, just a few lines. And if you want to solve the problem which I mentioned, double star which I mentioned on the previous page, you can just choose as sub-solution minus a constant, a large constant, P should be a large constant, and a super-solution uh, plus P, a positive large constant, 
and you see immediately that you have those inequalities. This is a sub-solution you have used, a concept, so Laplacian does not, does not appear. So all you need is this inequality, theta e to the minus c, because uh, k is positive, this is obviously satisfied when c is very large, negative, well, minus c, so. And uh, plus c, you, may, you take c a uh, very large positive, and you have uh, immediately a, a super solution. Now, a, a final comment about this nonlinear TDE is that you have to watch very carefully the sign. Oh, by the way, and this method of sub and super solution had nothing to do with the exponential. You can, if you want to take a, an, any nonlinearity, the exponential of the exponential, exponential of u to a power, etc., it would work exactly the same, uh, the same way. Uh, just a final comment that if you replace, and this is very important, the sign in front of the Laplacian, uh, I, the way I wrote it is minus Laplacian of u plus theta e to the u equals the right hand side. Uh, if you replace this minus sign by a plus sign, then this is a completely different story. This is extremely difficult problem. Uh, it's the so-called Nuremberg problem not fully solved when, when, there are, when there is existence of solution under what conditions under function theta, et cetera. And this is a very active uh, field of uh, research. It's still uh, quite, quite open, uh, quite many open questions about this, about this simple looking equation, even in two, even in two dimensions. Okay, uh, so I'll stop here, and I really would like you to go back home and tell, when you teach a course in TDE, please, uh, or tell your colleagues not to forget to mention quantum. No, no, so no, you can. How is it possible that the Poincare was a famous mathematician? So, so what would you, how is it possible? Well, uh, it's a good question. I, I don't know how, how, how it was possible. I don't know how it was possible. Uh, if you look in the, if you look, uh, it's not absolutely correct. If you look in the, there were two papers of papers. The paper, the big paper that everyone, uh, in the announcement in 1900, he says, uh, I don't think I have it here, he says, people have considered earlier the Laplace, the, uh, the Dirichlet problem, and he says, uh, Hermann Schwarz, Neumann, Poincaré. But he doesn't say what they proved or what. He, he, put, he puts Poincaré together. Okay, that was in the announcement, the short paper, very short paper from 1900. There, the name Poincaré appears. Four years later, when he, he wrote this big paper in 1904, Poincaré had disappeared. I don't know why. This is probably, I don't know, you know, have you heard that France and Germany were not <laughs> terribly <laughs> friendly to each other? And uh, I don't know, that might be a, that might have been a reason of tension. Maybe there was some, uh, I don't know, maybe there was some personal Tension. I don't know. I'm not sure there was really personal tension because later on, uh, in I think in 1908, 1909, Hilbert invited Poincaré. He, he invited to. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a very, very good question. Why Hilbert? Uh, anyway, he passed this. He definitely passed this diary to Courant, and uh, Courant felt that uh, he had also to hide that. That's, that's more embarrassing. And I, I must say, I'm talking, talking to people at the Courant Institute, to Louis Nirenberg. Have you heard that Poincaré? Never heard. So it's clear that there was a problem connected with the, the Courant Institute, which was at the heart. What's more amazing, and this I don't know why, Adama, 1906, says other people, it's known. They have not mentioned Poincaré. There's a curse on the name of Poincaré. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know why Adama, for example, does not mention the name of uh, does not mention the name of Poincaré. And certainly in France, even he was uh, he was not he was he was forgotten, uh, not mentioned. I asked Jacques Louis Lyon about it. What do you know about Poincaré and PDE? Silence. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, I wanted to. Several remarks. Okay. First of all, I think that maybe this discrepancy was. Are you going to bring in the Russians who proved it before in parallel, the Russian school? <laughs> maybe somebody in Princeton. But right. I just wanted to say that it's maybe because of Klein. I find sorry? That, that was because of Klein, the relation of Montreal. Oh, Klein. Klein. Yes, yes. yes. Klein. That was a general attitude to von Carré in German. German, German. Okay, possibly, possibly. That's interesting. Yeah, then the other remark is the following that you mentioned Bernstein yes. in his paper of 1906. The continuation method, yes. Yeah, if I remember correctly, at that time he was. Yes. Yes, yes, that's, that's quite possible. That's yeah. quite possible, indeed, 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 indeed. And the third remark is, is just a question. Who was the first to write the deistic proof of the It's a good question. I don't know who was the first. A good question. Maybe he knows. Maybe he knows. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Jean Marois has a, the big expert. A uh, probabilistic proof. Uh, who who was the first one to give a probabilistic proof? What? No, maybe Wiener, as you say, maybe could be, could be. It's a good question. I'm sorry, I cannot tell. Concerning the, the relation between Poincaré and Hilbert, th th there is a fact. So I think they were competing to be the best mathematician of the world in this time. And I think Hilbert was much more concerned with this competition that Poincaré was not, that was not in his character. Yes. And an example, the Bolyai Prize was attributed for the first time in 1905 to the best mathematician of the world of the time, whatever it means. And, and so uh, there was a committee, and Klein was in the committee, and the competitors were, of course, Poincaré and Hilbert. And Klein was supposed to write the report on the winner. And the winner was Poincaré. And Klein refused to write the report, so the report was written by Radosch, uh, not so famous mathematician from Hungary. Because the second uh, Bolyai Prize was attributed a few years later, then again, for the best mathematician of the time. Of course, Poincaré already has got it and was in the committee of the prize. And the prize was attributed to Hilbert, and Poincaré wrote the report. <laughs> he was a nice guy. He was a very nice guy. In addition to everything, that's good to say it. Any other question? I could just add a, a, a comment to that. It concerns the invitation from Hilbert to Poincaré to give these six lectures in Göttingen. The first two lectures are on PDEs and Fred Holmes' work. And it caused consternation in Göttingen. They were really upset. They felt patronized. This was their work, and somehow Poincaré was telling them to do it differently. And when we get to the second Boyai Prize, Poincaré praises Hilbert throughout until he gets to PDEs, and he says, but of course, the real breakthrough is the work of Fredholm. So I think, actually, there is a little more competition from the French side here, um, understandably. But also, this may be part of your an the answer to your question, that Poincaré has found in Fred Holm a worthy successor, and is in some sense, being a generous person, prepared to say, well, you know, 
the real way to do this is Fred Holmes. So he himself passes the, 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 the crown to another person. And that line of work is more consonant with the way Hilbert also wrote the theory, it seems to me. So maybe that's part of the answer to your question that Poincaré, being a modest person, absents himself yes. from the, the story. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. By the way, you say that uh, Hilbert is not crediting uh, Poincaré. Poincaré. What? You say that Hilbert, Hilbert. is not crediting uh, Poincaré for the Dirichlet problem, but uh, Poincaré himself is crediting uh, Schwartz for... I'm sorry, what? Poincaré himself, uh, in his paper, is, yes. is more or less saying that all the ideas are in uh, Schwartz's paper. No, 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 he doesn't say that. Uh, no, 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 I think you misunderstood what I said. He's, uh, there are two papers of Poincaré. The first from 1890 is the balayage method. And Poincaré says, I mean, it's very clear that this is an original method and uh, that it works in general domain. He says Neumann method, which was completely different. And he's, uh, he attributes the credit to Neumann for solving the Laplace equation, the Dirichlet principle, in convex domain. He says that. Then, a few years later, and that's our, the second paper that I mentioned, he says, now I am com coming back to the method, which was not the original, it was not my original method. I'm coming back to the method of Neumann because I like it and I think that numerically, if we were to compute the solution, this would be more efficient than the balayage method. On the other hand, he says also, so he gives a proof using the, uh, he gives a proof of existence of a solution using the idea of uh, Neumann. But on the other hand, he also says very clearly in this second proof, this is not really a second proof because inside the proof, I insert the fact that I already know the existence. So it's not really a second existence proof. I, I would call it, it's more like a more efficient method for computing the solution. And there he gives credit to Neumann. Uh, for that. Nevertheless, the, the balayage method is some kind of generalization of the alternating method of Schwartz. Yes. 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 So to go it from sounds, Schwartz to, to Poincaré is not so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. And the uh, alternating method of Schwartz was already very powerful. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, okay. It can't yeah, organize a, a conference in honor of uh, Hermann Schwartz someday. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe suggest, suggest to people in Germany, where was he also in Göttingen, uh, that they should organize a conference in. There will be a conference in the Hilbert uh, 100th year death at, uh, in about 40 or 30-something years. And